Hello and welcome. I'm Stephen Beatty. I'm the review editor at Quill and Quire, and I was also honored to be one of the jurors for the 2020 Trillium Awards this year. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's live event on behalf of Ontario Creates. Ontario Creates plays a leading role in supporting Ontario's creative economy by providing innovative programs and services to help creative industries grow and create award-winning and innovative content. Ontario Creates works with many talented creators across Ontario's screen, music, and publishing sectors. And it is the publishing sector that brings us all here today with the Trillium Book Awards. This year's winners join the long list of talented Ontario authors whose work has been honored here at home and around the world. Every year, the Trillium Book Awards gives us an opportunity to shine a light on the literary excellence. And as we celebrate, we also reflect on the power of storytelling. We acknowledge that this land we are on brings with it a rich history, including myriad stories that have been told over many years, and important and creative literature that is emerging today. We are grateful for the opportunity to gather, create, and share on this land. This year's winner for the Trillium Book Award for Poetry is Roxana Bennett for her collection titled Unmeaningable, published by Gordon Hill Press. Her publisher, Jeremy Luke Hill of Gordon Hill Press, will be joining us today. Hi, Jeremy. Hello. Taya Mutonji is the winner of this year's Trillium Book Award for her collection of short stories, Shut Up, You're Pretty, published by VS Books, Arsenal Pulp Press. Welcome, Taya. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Uh, before we begin, we hope that you will also be a part of the conversation. Please submit your questions to us using the hashtag ONCreates, hashtag ONCreates. Our social media team will follow questions, we'll forward questions to me, and uh, we'll answer those that we can. If you'd like to find out more about the authors, there are short video interviews at Ontario Creates' YouTube channel. And uh, now it gives me great pleasure to uh, launch into this conversation with uh, Jeremy and Taya. And first of all, congratulations sincerely to the both of you. Um, I, I, I've had the opportunity to obviously to read your book, Taya, and, and also to read Roxana's collection. And they're both astounding works and I think hugely deserving of every accolade and honor that they receive. And I think that's a good place to start, actually, because this is about Ontario Creates. It's about the, the Trillium Book Awards, which have quite a long history at this point of awarding Ontario writers who uh, who have gone on to sort of, you know, become canonical authors in Canada. So I wondered, Taya, if we could start with you in terms of what this award means to you. I was interested to read a, an interview you did with Deborah Dundas in the Toronto Star, where you, uh, you said about the nomination for the Trillium Award that it gave you license to imagine a career for yourself. And I wonder if you could mm -hmm. just expand on that a little bit and, and, and what that imaginative, um, you know, imaginative career looks like for you at this point? My trajectory into publishing was extremely fast in the sense that I was working on these stories in my last year of creative writing and I submitted in the fall and found out that it would be getting published. And I hadn't fully decided if I considered myself a writer at that time or if I wanted a career in, in publishing because it seemed so impossible. And when I submitted to the contest that they hosted, really it was just something to do. It's like, you know, when you have a summer and there's nothing happening, so you're like, I'm just going to do a thing and see it through. <laughs> and that, this was just the thing I did, writing my manuscript and seeing it through. And then I submitted it kind of like because my friends pressured me to and because I had spent four months working on it, so why not? Um, and then it just so happens that this is the book that got selected and I had forgotten that I submitted it. I was like, okay, moving on with my life now. So all of a sudden I had to write a book and then I published it. And throughout that entire process, I still hadn't really had enough time to be like, what does a career in Canadian literature look like for me? Um, and with the Write It Writer's Stress Award, when I got nominated for that one, even that was really, really fast. I hadn't, I still was kind of like, I'm going to go back to school and I'll get a master's and a PhD and I'm going to get a farm. Like my life was really different. Um, so when I got this nomination, I, I felt a bit more not prepared, but more serious or more welcoming to get attention for my book. Whereas before I was like, this is so strange. And that kind of, I guess that kind of recognition kind of makes you want to explore what else you can do with 
what's happening and that's kind of what happened with this with uh, this nomination i was like okay well maybe maybe i can actually manage a few extra books maybe i don't have to just sleep all day <laughs> so <laughs> that was nice <laughs> In terms of uh, this publication, um, this is the first book to be published by Vivek Shraya's, under Vivek Shraya's imprint at Arsenal Paul Press, VS Books. Um, how important was that for you? And could you talk a little bit about the process of working with Vivek and how she ed edited your work and mentored you and, and sort of transformed this book into what it is now? Uh, Vivek was actually the first person of color mentor that I had which was really big for me because I'm so used to writing stories and that most of the people who are editing it or talking with me about it are people who are predominantly white. And so they don't, there's certain things that I, I have to unpack or explain, or there are certain things that I, I basically can't get away, uh, get away with without um, being conscious of the fact that my reader has a completely different set of expectation for a story than I might have. And so there was that immediate ease was removed with working with Vivek, which meant that I had a lot more freedom and I wasn't as calculated when I was writing my stories. So I wasn't overthinking definition. I wasn't overthinking how to make something more palatable. And the fact that Vivek's reaction to my work has always been to push it forward as opposed to, it wasn't really criticism. It was more like, what else can we do with this? You know, it was always look at, we're going to look at a story. And then the questions that she was asking kind of helped me think with intention. Whereas I think coming from a poetry and nonfiction background, I read a lot from a feeling as opposed to a goal or an intention. And it was really nice to have someone to kind of remind me that that's also really important in storytelling. Um, so sometimes when you're writing from a feeling, there's a lack of luster there because some feelings sometimes don't have and then it doesn't have a conclusion. So it's good to have a bit more structure. And Vivek was definitely there to guide me towards making that shift in my writing. And that's changed the way I interact with writing completely. So I'm no longer like, okay, the feeling is anger. So let's explore anger. Now I'm more, I think more about everything beyond the, just the feeling and beyond just the story. And um, that was definitely from the way that Vivek, the language she used in, in working with me is what got me to that point. I'd like to come back to uh, to your writing process and uh, the specific style and, and genre of Shut Up, You're Pretty in a minute. But Jeremy, I think it's it, this is a good point to, to jump off to uh, Roxana's book as well, because in addition to Shut Up, You're Pretty being the first book on VS Books' inaugural list, uh, Unmeaningable is one of the first books from Gordon Hill, publishing, which is a new poetry press. Um, can you speak a little bit to what it means to win an award, like right out of the gate for a small press, not just a small press in Canada, which is hard enough to launch, but a small poetry press in Canada? Yeah, um, I'm going to get to that right in a second. I want to read right from the top of something that uh, Roxana has said to us to, to contribute to the conversation. And she just wanted to pass on her thanks to people. Uh, she says, I'm deep, great, deeply grateful to the Indigenous people who have been stewards of this land. I would like particularly to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Skagog Island First Nation. Thank you to Ontario Creates for the generous award for a meaningful, and to my publisher Gordon Hill and editor Shane Nielsen. If you're wondering why I'm not making this acknowledgement myself, like millions of people, I'm physically and mentally disabled, and in an ability, unfortunately, doesn't change even when there are exciting things like awards and pandemics. I'd like to extend compassionate attention in particular to every person who is mentally ill, incarcerated, hospitalized, restrained, locked in with an abuser, unable to experience breath of fresh air or to feel light upon their face, who feels that they've been forgotten and abandoned. I love you. You are needed and seen. Uh, thank you to each and every person for reading and supporting poetry. So <clears throat> that's from Roxana. Uh, as a press, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, Vivek has a similar sense is uh, having a, a very first book at that kind of attention is, uh, I mean, it's a really big thing. One of my big worries when we started this press was that we wouldn't be able to get the really good books we had on, on, uh, on, 
our uh, on our schedule coming out the kind of attention that they deserved um, because there's so many books out there and it's so hard for them to get the kind of attention that they need and uh, so it was wonderful to see a really deserving book like Roxanne is getting the attention that it deserved because it's a great book and um, and so for us just the the opportunity to feature that book and get it out in the world and get people to have a look on it is is a pretty big deal and then also uh, as you said as a mostly poetry press we do some other things also but um, as a poetry press to kind of get that attention out there um, that, that's a big deal too because um, you know there's there are uh, unfortunately not uh, as many poetry readers in the, in the world as you might like and to be able to have this get uh, in front of them and have them pick it up take a look and see that we're doing good things you know it also helps the other authors um, who were publishing to get some attention also. So it's a, it's, it's a big deal for us, for sure. Uh, it's interesting that in, and in reading that, uh, that statement from Roxana, um, it highlights uh, the, the subject and the theme of the book, which is disability justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, she herself has described herself as a mentally ill, non-neurotypical person who is also physically disabled. And I wondered if you could speak to how important or why it was important for you to bring out that book in that way about that subject. Is this sort of an opening up of Canadian literature to disability justice, discussions of disability justice, um, an opening up to new voices that have not been traditionally heard in Canadian literature? Well, one of our goals, uh, Shane Nielsen is our editor, uh, poetry editor at Gordon Hill, uh, and he also describes himself as uh, as suffering from mental disability. And one of our goals as a press is to feature uh, authors who uh, live with disability, who are disabled, um, particularly those who uh, have invisible disabilities. Um, so Roxana was kind of a, a beautiful moment for us in that uh, I had come into contact with her work el elsewise and loved it. And when we sat down to work through what we wanted to put out uh, as our first book, she was kind of the obvious um, person to select because she does represent so much of what we want to do uh, in, in terms of representing disabled voices in Canada, uh, but also it's such a great book. And so uh, we really felt like having her as the inaugural book was, uh, was what we wanted to do. Um, but our long-term goals as a press do really involve uh, consistently making a place for uh, disabled writers because uh, it isn't always easy um, to get those things out there. If you're if you're somebody like Roxana who isn't able to be on social media, who you know isn't able to go out in front of people and present yourself, it's really hard to promote a book. And as you know, publishers often, I mean, what they're looking for, especially if you're a small press, is your ability to kind of get out there and sell books on your own and, and kind of make a, a place for yourself. And so it really, even if the writing is very good, that book might not be attractive to a publisher. We want to make a place where those issues aren't what we take into consideration first, where we say, is this a good book? And if it is, we're going to find ways to help get your book out there because um, uh, we don't want that to be a barrier for, for people with disability. In terms of shining spotlights on uh, communities that have uh, traditionally gone unheard or unrecognized, uh, Tay, it's Scarborough, which is where Shut Up Your Pretty is set, seems to be having a moment these days, uh, what with David Cherry Andy's book, uh, Brother, and Catherine Hernandez's Scarborough and your own book. I read, I can't remember whether it was in an interview or whether it was something you said on Twitter where somebody made that comment that Scarborough's had, having a moment. And, and you responded by saying, Scarborough's always been here, you guys just haven't been paying attention. Or words to that effect. I'm, I'm wondering to what extent were you conscious of shining a spotlight on this neighborhood in Toronto, in, in the East End of Toronto, and how important was that setting for you as you were writing? The idea of shining a light to Scarborough wasn't something that I was intentionally doing. I was writing about a community that I loved and a place that I was familiar with, and that it felt natural for my character. The idea of it being like Scarrow's this big thing only happened really after the book was over and I finished writing it and we were putting it in conversation with other books that feature Scarrow. But to kind of tie that down with what's happening um, with the Black Lives Movement right now, if you don't live in that community, you think it's news. It's, you think it's different. But like Black lives, Indigenous lives have always been going through the same sense of oppression that they've had 
without the internet telling you that it's happening. And just now that, you know, the cameras are turning or in this case, books are being written about it. Now we're all like, oh, look, this thing exists. But to us, it's like almost a bit of an annoying to hear people say that it's having a moment or to be like, whoa, look at all the oppression black people faces. We're like, what? What are you talking about? That form, that's it's kind of a very jarring feeling to feel like, all these times you've been experiencing one thing or in the case of Scarborough for me enjoying one thing and then someone suddenly wakes up and point like someone who's big like points their finger at it and suddenly everybody else is looking at it it's great it's nice we're happy that it's all being acknowledged but that's not without the emotional uncomfortableness of like what did we need to do to get this form of attention it's it's kind of frustrating to to think of how many writers have to wear Scarborough on their back with so much pride for it to be taken seriously in the same sense that we have all these people protesting for Black Lives Movement to be taken seriously. Those things are exhausting. So I don't love hearing things like Scarborough's having a moment. I'm like, no, <laughs> Scarborough has been neglected and ignored and having also lived in Scarborough. And it, it's like my, it's still my favorite place till this day and also having lived downtown Toronto, the way the city cares for Scarborough is super different than how we care for Toronto. Um, there is a story that I wrote about a light that just is like an intersection that wouldn't get fixed. And that was actually a reality that I experienced when I lived in an apartment on Morningside and Military Trail. It was like that entire summer traffic light is broken and no one cares. And I was like, what is happening? How are we leaving this for like three weeks on end? And no one cared. Those kind of things wouldn't happen downtown Toronto. That's frustrating. So I put that in the book because it's true and it's happening. And I don't think it's fair that it's just like, how can we just neglect certain parts of the GTA just because? What, because more marginalized folks live there, more immigrants live there? Like that is just wild to me. And that is why I wrote the story the way I did. But it wasn't in hopes of joining a, a supposed movement that feels like a fallacy to us. You know, it's not we get together and we just recognize what it feels like to be somewhere that's super loving. It's not about like, let's create a cheerleader team. You know? <laughs> so were you, were you interested in overturning stereotypes that people have about Scarborough? Because I think too, of that story that begins with the, there's a young man who gets beaten to death. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and the traditional arc of that story would be a young man gets beaten to death. And, you know, there's, uh, there are either mass uprisings because of this or the kind of thing we're seeing now with Black Lives Matter in the States and so on and so forth. But what actually happens in your story is that becomes the catalyst for the entire community to recognize the good in the community and to come together in a very joyful and very hopeful way, which is kind of counterintuitive. Were you working against those stereotypes consciously as you were writing? Absolutely. That's true for all of my characters too. Like for Loli, the way that I crafted her was with the intention of creating someone who goes up against the stereotypes and makes conscious decision of either succumbing to them or rejecting them. And that's also how I always seen Scarborough. The way that people talk about Scarborough versus how you experience it, it's different. But I, I believe that that might be true for a lot of different things in life. Um, but that was really important to me because the idea of safety or lack of safety in Scarborough is something like I've lived in London, Ontario. I've lived in Oshawa. I've lived downtown Toronto. I have never felt safe in any of those communities. And to be very frank, it's because I was experiencing a level of racism that is just unheard of in Scarborough. And that's also the same idea with living in a community like Galloway, where everybody, because we are going through certain life events simultaneously and that kind of mirror each other, the feeling of safety and of support is very present. I don't have that when I'm living down in Toronto in an apartment by myself, where I'm surrounded by people who don't look like me and who look at me differently. That feeling of insecurity of if something were to happen in this moment, I will be alone. I've never experienced that in Scarborough. And that's it's from that feeling that I created this idea of kind of going up against different stereotypes I've heard of Scarborough, because the reality of living there for me at least has been very different than the narrative that's been supposed to it. So th that was an intentional thing for sure. Battling stereotypes uh, also seems to be behind um, what Roxana is doing in Unmeaningable um, in terms of battling stereotypes about neurodiverse people, um, physically disabled people, and so on. But she, she does it through the, the form of her work as much as the content of her work. The book sort of starts with a series of 
fairly typical sonnets. And then the sonnets, as the book goes on, she continues with that form, but the sonnets themselves kind of break down. And that sort of becomes, in my reading, that becomes kind of a metaphor for the way a neurodiverse person approaches the world or has to approach the world. Um, it's interesting because this kind of dovetailed with a book on the, the shortlist for the Trillium Book Award called Sister Language, which is also um, an examination of neurodiversity through language. I was wondering, you may not be the right person to ask, Jeremy, but I was wondering if you, if you could talk a little bit about the way that book is structured and how the language was used to reflect Roxana's own condition and her own concerns. Yeah, uh, I think you, you're reading that really accurately. Uh, I first ran into Roxana's work um, in relation to a, a chapbook that was put out by Night Fork Book. And it's the first chunk of this larger and meaningful book. Um, and I loved it so much that I, I reviewed it and, and was in contact with her about it at that point. Um, and that's sort of the reading I put on there too. And, and, and Roxanne and I have chatted about this a, a couple of times. That sort of sonnet crown, each sonnet leading to the other, last line to first line, is the sort of overarching structure that she's taking and then, and then messing with. And it starts fairly regular, as you say, but there are also places in that structure where she sticks poems that are not remotely sonnets, where she breaks that sonnet crowd apart, just like a knife comes into it, it's like disruption. And then also, as the sonnets get along, they start to become less and less formally sonnets, even though there's almost always something that indicates that it's it's riffing on the, the form of the sonnet. And and so it's, it's a way of, of expressing the, 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 the that feeling of this disintegration of, of, of the structure being pulled apart, both as uh, as, a, as someone living with disability, but also as someone who's having to endure the medical system with disabilities, having to go through um, through life and facing these things, and how those pressures sort of pull apart the narrative in, in ways that aren't always within the control of the person who's, in this case, writing, but who's, who's living this life. Um, so yeah, I would say that's absolutely a, a, an intentional part of the way that she's going, uh, she's going about presenting that, that structure is to kind of have that metaphor representation uh, happening there. In terms of um, structuring books, Taya, uh, I was interested in uh, the way you put together Shut Up, You're Pretty, because it also dovetails with another book on the, on the uh, Trillium Book Award list, Zalika Reed Benta's uh, Frying Plant, and both of them being uh, collections of linked stories that follow a single character through a uh, kind of coming-of-age arc. Um, could you talk a little bit about how that structure came about with Shut Up, You're Pretty? Yeah, that, that was originally an accident in the sense that when I was putting together the manuscript, I was combining a lot of the different works I had done throughout my undergrad at UTSC, specifically in the creative writing minor. And I noticed while I light out all of my work that I keep writing about Jolie and Loli separately in different stories and then sometimes in the same story. But every time they were always little girls growing up in Galloway. And if not Galloway, then maybe they're in like Melbourne or another area of Scarborough that I was fairly familiar with. And um, I had a predominant amount of stories like that and that's why when i was done writing the manuscript i kind of had to be like okay well this works i have too much of this to kind of just randomly change it because it, it would make sense to have a short story collection where like 10 stories are about the same two characters and then the rest are different so that was just kind of like i worked with what i had as resources um and then when i started intentionally putting it together i made a timeline that i started at the age of six and i ended at the age of 26 and i kind of wrote life events that I felt would be appropriate for each age. And I went back to the work I already had and I manipulated the stories to fit a very tight timeline. There are a few stories that I ended up deleting in the last, the end, which is why there's a bit of a gap from the age is a bit more rushed there um, because I, I felt that these stories could be used in a different collection or they just didn't fit as strongly with the rest. So I think there was like three stories that I just took right out and that made the collection smaller, but I also feel like it makes a bit more natural in the sense that what happens in adulthood, it's sometimes so hard to keep up with and so not linear that you'll go from like hating your mother in one second to loving her and there's no real explanation. <laughs> so that ended up feeling very natural. So 
sometimes it's just things kind of fit together. And then once you realize a natural angle is coming together, then I would go back and edit it for it to be a bit more specific. But I had like a big board with the timeline and like <laughs> one word of what would happen. Like, ooh, she gets her period here. Or like, ooh, she gets the boy here. Like, those are things that I had a lot of fun doing. Um, and it was just like my little board that I kept for it the entire time I was writing. We're uh, we're rapidly running out of time, but I want to ask you both uh, the same sort of intertextual question. Um, and Taya, it comes from a uh, a comment that Loli's father makes in one of the stories in Shut Up, You're Pretty. He quotes Albert Camus from L'Etranger, uh, who said, there is no love of life without despair about life. Uh, now, I found it also interesting to, to listen to you in an interview where you talked about this book being more somber than you usually are. Um, and I, I was interested in, in finding out why that is, but I'm also interested in finding out to what extent you agree with Camus on that. There is no um, love of life without despair of life. You know, that Camus is just a bit too overtly taught in French schools. <laughs> and I was kind of forced to read all the Camus books. So I kind of like know it by heart. So that kind of another thing that happened a little bit by accident where I was like, oh yeah, this thing. But um, for honestly, like, I don't really know why the book ended up being so dark. I think I was just really pissed off. I was really like, I, I felt a lot of rage when I sat down to write the stories. I was mourning for all the women who experienced violence, all the little girls who the way that they understand life is through this like sense of consent, com complete danger. And this was just before the Me Too movement really came about. And I was, you know, I, I was really like involved with just what it feels like to be a woman at that time in my life. And I'm writing this book and I'm angry and being mad and recognizing that the world is kind of an evil place sometimes is a lot of the feelings that led to me writing this book the way that it came out. Um, but then I got to the editing process and I remember that I'm actually a really bubbly, annoying person. And then I was like, well, let's put some funny moments here and there. So <laughs> I think it, you know, sometimes that just happens. I don't like if I had written that I wouldn't be able to write Shut Up You're Pretty today because my perspective on life has changed and the things I'm involved with has changed. But um, so it was really interesting for me to go through things that I knew were like really hardcore. Like I, I remember rereading um, Emma Bovary a lot that summer. Actually, I was reading it again while I was writing this book and I was like, Emma has something going on here. <laughs> like, that's right. Life sucks sometimes. So it just ended up being a bit darker. And Camille was totally just because I wanted something French because I knew the character was French, but I kept forgetting to make her more French. So I was like, let's find a Camille quote. <laughs> and there are even moments where I'm like, what does my dad listen to? Because my dad listens to a lot of French music. So I, I went through my dad's playlist and I found music that just related. So yeah, I, I like to just use things that I know are from my my life because I, I can attribute, attribute meaning in a way that I think I wouldn't be able to do if I was fishing somewhere else. Hey, thank you so much. I, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there, Jeremy. I, I really wanted to get to uh, the question about the suite of Hannibal Lecter poems in uh, in Unmeaningable. Uh, we're not going to have time, unfortunately, um, but uh, I would recommend that readers go out and, and look for both of these books because um, they're both uh, they're both really stellar works, and uh, you both deserve uh, Taya and, and and Roxanne both deserve uh, uh, great. Congratulations for uh, for these works. So I'm afraid uh, this concludes our in conversation event with our Trillium winners. We've run out of time. Thank you to Taya, Jeremy, and congratulations to Roxana. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. And please be sure to pick up these books and those written by all the finalists from your independent bookstore. We'll post in the chat a link to a Google Map where you can find the independent bookstore closest to you. And I should let you know that uh, in this space tomorrow at noon. We will be in conversation with the French language host Zefred, who will be talking to pre Trillium winner Paul Rubin and pre de Poesie winner Veronique Sylvain. So join us again right here tomorrow at noon. Uh, we're going to leave you with a retrospective video made for the 30th anniversary of the Trillium Award in 2017. We look forward to seeing Roxana and Taya in the next iteration of that video and hope that this will leave you inspired with the wealth of Ontario literary talent. Thank you again. Please read often, read widely. Thanks for joining us.